Well, again, good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. It's an exciting morning. We're getting uh, near to the end of the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 21, the second half, starting in verse, uh, verse 9 uh, through 27 this morning. It's a description of the eternal city of God. It's a description of our home, our future home. And as you know, the title of this book and its theme is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 21, not only is the glory of God revealed, and, and by the way, the eternal city of God is all about the glory of God. The glory of God shines through the city. We'll see that as we go through the text this morning. But there's not a corner of the city of God where the glory of God does not shine. So the revelation of Jesus Christ is the book of Revelation. It's God revealing Christ in his glory. And we'll see his glory shining through the, the city of God this morning. And the key word, again, found in this book is the word throne. Found 46 times. And it's a great reminder, and we need this reminder, that God is still on the throne. Amen. Uh, the more we see things go upside down in our world, our state... <laughs> the more we need to be reminded that God is still on the throne. He's still firmly in control. And he'll bring all of this to its glorious conclusion for those of us who believe. And so I, as I mentioned this morning, we're going to take a look at the eternal state and specifically the eternal city, New Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven, from God. And I, you got to like that. This is the city of God. It's the city that God built. Man didn't have a, a hand in this. He didn't have a part in this. I mean, I build stuff all the time, and sometimes it's level, and <laughs> sometimes it's square. And when it's not, i got to make corrections, but this will be the city that is perfect, that it will be perfectly square, that every line will be straight, there won't be a thing amiss in it, because God will have made it. And it won't be defiled by man's hands, amen? It won't be defiled by man, there will be nothing in it, there won't be a, a contract that some politician made with his buddy who ran a trucking company to get a discount on some concrete that's substandard, right? Won't be anything like that in the, in the New Jerusalem. Everything will be perfect. Now last week, we read in Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 and 2. It said, now I, and that's John the Apostle, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city. New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So the tribulation period is now over. Christ has ruled and reigned uh, on this current earth for a thousand years. And after that thousand year period, Satan is loosed from the bottomless pit and he goes out to deceive the nations again. At that time, God throws Satan into the lake of fire for all eternity. He destroys this present world and this present universe. He judges all the unbelieving dead, and he casts them into the lake of fire along with Satan and his demons for all eternity. He then creates a brand new heaven and a new earth where all believers of all ages will dwell in a city called New Jerusalem. This is the picture we have in the remaining verses of chapter 21. And it's an incredible picture that the Apostle John paints for us. And, and as we read this chapter, keep in mind that John is, is limited in his, in his ability to describe this to us. He has to use earthly descriptions and earthly uh, symbols to make sense of something that is so otherworldly that it's almost beyond description. It challenges our understanding of the universe as we know it today in its current state. So John uses earthly descriptions so that we can get a glimpse 
and a little understanding of what the heavenly scene will look like in the future. And even with this description, we can't see the glory that John saw. John was there. John saw the glory. He's trying, I mean, try to describe the glory of God. The God who made the universe. I mean, we look out into the universe with telescopes and, and we see phenomenal structures, amazing things, nebula and, 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 and just things that just boggle the mind. That's all created by our God. God is so much greater than his creation. Amen. So John trying to describe the glory of God is like an ant trying to describe a man. It's even worse than that. <laughs> but unless you've seen it, as John did, you can't adequately understand what God has prepared for those who love him. So if you're not already there, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21, beginning in verses 9 through 11. Then... One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues. Those were the seven last bowls of God's judgment upon this Christ-rejecting world. Well, that angel, one of those angels, came uh, to me, John said, and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now one of the angelic beings that had been used by God to pour out his final judgments on this world reveals to the Apostle John the bride the Lamb's wife. Now, it's, it's called a bride. It's called the Lamb's wife. But it's also called a city because the people of God live in this city. It's a real city, but the people of God are so associated with this city that it's considered the bride, the Lamb's wife. And no doubt this angel is intended to display for us the contrast between the followers of the Antichrist and the followers of of Jesus Christ. The angel serves, you see, as a connection between the two, having poured out the last bowls of God's plagues upon this world. So the followers of the Antichrist are judged, separated from God, and cast into the lake of fire for all eternity, while the followers of Jesus Christ enjoy an eternal relationship with God in a newly created universe, on a new planet Earth, and they even get a new city, New Jerusalem. The angel who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues uh, carried John away in the spirit to a, a great and high mountain and showed him the city. Uh, as we'll see later in this chapter, uh, this city is so big so enormous, so mind-boggling in its dimensions that John had to be taken up to a great and high mountain in order, order to be able to see its glory, to see its size. We read here that it descended out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. This city is all about the glory of God. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not made with human hands. It's not made with human engineering. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10, uh, the Bible says this of Abraham. It says, For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. This is that city, the city that Abraham waited for. And the following verses give us a description of this coming city. And it is glorious. As glorious as John could describe it with human words and understanding. Lastly, again, this city is called the bride, the Lamb's wife, because it is so associated with the people of God, you see. In fact, the Bible says it is adorned as a bride. I mean, the most lovely thing that John could think of when he saw this 
was a bride, all decked out, all dolled up, all dressed up for her wedding day. The most beautiful thing you could think of. And that's what he thought of, and that's what he compared it to. Look now at verses 12 and 13. Also she, that is the city, the bride, associated with the people of God, also she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. So at the entrance gates to the eternal city of God will forever be a reminder of God's covenant people, Israel. Their names, the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Who are the children of Israel, by the way? Oh, Israel was the name God gave to Jacob. Jacob was the son of Isaac. Isaac was the son of Abraham. So who are the, 12, the, the children of Israel? They're the descendants of Jacob. They are the Jewish people. Their names are inscribed on the gates going into New Jerusalem. God forever memorializes his covenant people. Amen? Amen. We need to be aware of that. God, God honors them for eternity. So we best give a little honor down here. Amen? Amen. If God honors them for eternity, we ought to show them some honor down here. Now, they're back in their land today. They're back in unbelief. But at the end of the tribulation period, they will come to be saved. All Israel will be saved. Those who are remaining will be saved. So this is a memorial for them. And the arrangement in uh, three names and three gates on each side reminds us, if you know your Old Testament scriptures, this reminds us of how the tribes of Israel were arranged around the tabernacle in the Old Testament. In fact, in fact, if you looked at those tribes and their arrangement around the tabernacle, there were tribes that were larger than other tribes. And if you looked at the arrangement, what you would find is the largest tribe was arranged this direction. The smallest tribe was arranged here. Two equal tribes, or, or several of the tribes that were equal, were arranged here. If you were to look at the arrangement of the tribes of Israel from the air, looking down around this center tabernacle, it would have looked, resembled a cross. Isn't that fascinating? How God did that. Our God is an awesome God. Amen? I mean, you see these things and you just, you just go, wow! Wow! Amazing! But you see, even in eternity, God has not forgotten his people, Israel, through whom the Messiah came. Amen? Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Let's not forget, our, our Savior is a Jewish man, right? A Jewish carpenter. I like the fact that he was a builder. I like the fact that he's gone to heaven to build us a place. And he's been working on it for 2,000 years. And we're going to see that place this morning. Now look at verse 14. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them, the foundations, were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So here we find the 12 apostles of the Lamb who were foundational to the building of the church after the ascension of Christ back to heaven. They will likewise be remembered for all eternity. We read this in Ephesians uh, 2.20, that we, the church, have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So God honors them, and their names, the apostles, are inscribed on the foundation stones of New Jerusalem. And don't miss the distinction here. First, we read of Israel, and here we read of the church. The one, you see, has not replaced the other. They are both remembered by God, but they are each distinct. They each had their place, and yet they are connected, but not the same in God's program. Amen? You understand that? 
The church is not Israel. Okay? You can go to the land of Israel. You can see Israelis. You can be there. That's Israel. You sitting here are not Israel, unless you're Jewish, of course. But the church is not Israel, and, and we need to get that through our heads and understand that. And if we don't understand that, then we begin to confuse who God is speaking to in the scriptures about various things. Israel's going through the tribulation. If you want to be Israel, feel free, okay? <laughs> the church is not going to be here. Now look at verses 15 and 16. And he who talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. We have no description in the Bible given of the new earth. But it must be enormous. It must be uh, many times bigger than the planet Jupiter because the size of New Jerusalem, 12,000 furlongs, is about 1,500 miles long, wide, and tall. It's a cube. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Now, to put this in terms that we might be able to understand, this would be uh, akin to a city that stretched from Maine to Florida and from the East Coast to Colorado. One city. And, and, and lest we forget, and 1,500 miles tall as well. I mean, that boggles the mind. I mean, thinking from Earth, we're just, nah, how can that possibly be? Well, that's because we're thinking based on what we know today, not based on what God is going to create in the future. In fact, God gives us absolutely no description of what this earth that this city sits upon will look like. Can you imagine it? I mean, I don't know. Will there be, will God recreate dinosaurs and will they be wandering around and, and we'll get to see them? I mean, I, I don't know what it will look like. The Bible tells us nothing. But to put a city this size on a planet, you better have a pretty big planet. Amen? Amen. You know, Bible scholar Henry Morris uh, estimated that if 20% of all the people who have ever lived, and that's about 100 billion people, were saved. And, and that's, by the way, very, very generous. But if 20% of all the people who ever lived were saved, then this city would give each and every man, woman, and child, given that if there are children, I don't think there are, but it would give every person 75 acres on every side. I can, do, I can live with 75 <laughs> acres. My garden right now is like four by four. I mean, I, I could do with a bigger garden. But the dimensions of a planet to hold such a city must be enormous. Look now at verse 17. Then he, that is the angel, measured its wall, 144 cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. So apparently the angel used the same standard of measure as men in John's day did. That was a cubit which is about 18 inches, uh, the typical distance between the tip of a man's fingers and his elbow. So the walls of this city are about 216 feet high. So there's a wall around this city, okay, that's 216 feet high. And it says in verse 18, the construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. So going up for 216 feet is a wall of jasper, which is a diamond. Can you imagine the light refraction taking place 
as this city is surrounded by a wall made of pure, pure diamond. Wow. <laughs> That, that, I mean, again, John is trying to describe something to us that is indescribable. And then the city itself, it says, was pure gold like clear glass. Everything about this city is intended to allow the glory of God to shine forth into each and every corner. Everything is transparent in some way in a variety of colors and hues. It's, it's again, unimaginable. It's like nothing we have ever seen before. I, I don't know about you, but I've never seen pure gold as clear as glass. Anybody seen gold like that? So that's something that we've never seen in this creation, in this world, but it's something God is going to give in the new creation. Next, next John gives us a description of the foundations of the city and the gemstones that are associated with them. Look at verses 19 and 20. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh uh, chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh jacinth, uh, the twelfth amethyst. And, and some of the names of these gemstones have, have either changed or been lost to history, uh, but this city is set on the most beautiful and precious foundation imaginable. Again, made to reflect the glory of God. This, this city, this new creation is all about the glory of God. Hey, here's what these stones likely represent. Jasper, as we mentioned earlier, is a diamond. Sapphire is a, a brilliant blue color. Chalcedony is, is a blue stone with stripes. Emeralds are bright green. Uh, sardonyx is a, is a red stone that's white striped. A uh, sardius is kind of a red quartz color. Uh, chrysolite is a yellow-hued stone. A uh, beryl is various colors of green, yellow, and blue. A uh, topaz is a yellow, a uh, green gemstone. A uh, chrysophrase uh, is a gold-tinted green stone. Uh, jacinth is violet, and amethyst is purple. Heaven will be filled with color. Amen. Amen. Isn't that great to know? Heaven will be a colorful place. It's not all white. It's not you all sitting around on white clouds wearing white clothes. Um, having to wear sunglasses because everything's white, right? It's a colorful, colorful place. Unbelievably beautiful and colorful. It's going to be like, again, like nothing we have ever seen or can relate to here. Look now at verse 21. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Interesting that the gates are made of pearls. They are not rocks or gems, but they're only created. A pearl is only created when an irritant or wound causes an oyster to secrete a protective coating. They are the only thing in this city made by flesh. They will forever remind us of Christ's wounds, of his sacrifice on Calvary that made this precious saving grace available to us. Every time we walk through the pearly gates, we're going to be reminded that it was an irritant, it was a wound that caused Christ to die for our sins that made access into the city of God available to us. Isn't that incredible? I, I'm, that just, I mean, I can't even get my mind around all that that means in that, in that little nugget that the gates are made of pearls. Wow. God, God, God has given us a description that, that 
we'll be thinking about for all eternity when we see it. We also read here that the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Even the streets you see, even the streets that we walk upon in the eternal city are designed to allow the glory of God to shine through. Nothing in this city will obstruct God's glory. We're going to be walking on streets of gold. Currently, I live out in Greenhorn Ranch, and our streets are dirt. <laughs> My cars are always either muddy or dusty, so I'm looking forward to streets paved with gold. <laughs> I'd settle right now for asphalt. Look now at verses 22 and 23. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, the Lamb is its light. John was shocked, shocked to find no temple in the city. Every major city in John's day was full of temples of, to, to various deities. Not this one. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. You see, you don't need the representation of a thing when you have the real thing. Amen? See, that's it. You don't need a representation of a thing when you have the real thing. God himself and Jesus Christ will be the light of this city. You also don't need the sun or moon to shine in it when God's glory and the glory of Christ light up the city. Jesus said in John 8, 12, he said, I am the light of the world. And he will be the light of the coming world as well. We won't need created light because we will have the creator of light with us at all times. Amen. You see? Now look at verses 24 and through 26. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth uh, will bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Now the word translated here as nations is the Greek word ethnos, from which we get the, uh, the words race or uh, ethnicity. It's speaking about people. The people of those who are saved walk in its light. The people of God get to live in the city of God and enjoy the light of God, while the people who rejected God will live their lives in outer darkness. According to Jesus himself in Matthew 8.12, Matthew 22.13, and Matthew 25.30. Three times Jesus said that they will live in outer darkness. I don't know about you, but the very last place I want to be is the place of outer darkness, where you can't even see your hand in front of your face. That, that's terrifying. And it will be terrifying for all of those who have rejected God's gift of his only begotten son who came to die for the sins of the world. But the people of those who were saved get to walk in and experience the light, the glory of God that illuminates New Jerusalem. It also says here that the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Now, now who these kings of the earth are, we're not sure. But what we can be sure of is that everyone entering New Jerusalem will have to give up their glory and honor. They're going to bring their glory and honor into it. In other words, there is finally going to be true equality as everyone equally submits to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? They'll bring their glory and honor into it. Nobody's keeping glory and honor for themselves in otherwise, right? It all belongs to the Lord. Additionally, there will be nothing, nothing to fear in New Jerusalem. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, and there, there's going to be no night there. 
There will be no need to lock your door. It's all transparent anyway, right? <laughs> Why bother? We're just going to look in your house right through the wall. Well, there won't be any need to hide from anything, right? Everything will be transparent. The glory of God will shine everywhere. Nothing will obstruct the glory of God from shining. And it'll never get dark there. Because God's glory will continually shine throughout the city. Now look at verse 27, our last verse this morning. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now this doesn't mean that there will be anything in the new creation that could be sinful, but what it means is that no sinner who has ever been forgiven, or, or no sinner who has not been forgiven by Christ will by no means enter the eternal city or the new creation. There is no way to heaven except through faith in the person and completed work of Christ. Only those who have come to the Lamb for salvation will be in the Lamb's book of life and get to enjoy this new Jerusalem, this eternal state. What an incredible city God has prepared for those who love Him. Amen? Amen. What an incredible place this will be. Jesus said this in John 14, 1 through 3. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and since I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In this chapter this morning, God has given us a glimpse of our new home, the heavenly city, new Jerusalem. All who love the Lord will one day be united there forever. And I, I love that about this new city. It's going to be like church on Sunday morning. Everybody's going to be hanging out, talking, fellowship, and, you know, it, you're not going to be just off in some uh, back 40 of the universe by yourself somewhere, right? We're going to be together in the same city. It's a big city. But we'll be together. Amen. Those who don't, however, want to be there don't get to go there. But they don't get to party down in that other place either. The Bible says in the Gospel of Matthew that it will be a terrible place, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It will be a place of eternal torment. It will be a place of outer darkness. But the good news is you don't have to go to that place. You don't have to go there. God offers each and every person the free gift of salvation. It's already been paid for. Your ticket is already paid for and waiting for you. All you have to do is come and pick it up. Come and pick it up. Receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and you will enjoy this eternal city for eternity. Amen? It's as simple as that. Isn't that amazing? That God didn't make it difficult. He made it as simple as He could make it. And yet, so many reject God's Son. And because they reject God's Son, they will experience God's judgment. But you don't have to. The choice is yours. Choose eternal life with Christ or choose eternal suffering in the lake of fire. I think God would say, make your choice now before it's too late. Choose now whom you will serve. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we so thank you for your word. What a, an amazing, amazing glimpse of eternity you have given us. Uh, it's hard for us to even get our minds around all that we've read this morning. Hard to understand it all. Hard to, to fathom 
how glorious and wonderful and light-filled eternity will be. And yet, Lord, this is the description that you have given us. Lord, I pray that this description today will give your people such hope that our hearts will just overflow with hope for the future, hope for eternity. And Lord, for those that don't yet know you as their Lord and Savior, that they would surrender to your love. They would just surrender to your love. Stop trying to work it out on their own and just give in to your love and allow you to save them. Allow you to make that entrance through the pearly gates because of your sacrifice. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. Amen.